Hi everyone, uh, it's David Lomas here from uh, No Innovation. I'm just going to um, uh, introduce uh, the presenters tonight and just give you a bit of an overview of what's, uh, what the plan is. Um, I see um, probably two-thirds of people uh, did see the introductory session uh, last week. Um, for those of you who didn't, there is a, a recording of it uh, available, which is, I've just put a, a link in the uh, chat window there. If you want to go and have a look, that's the, the full version. I'm going to give you the 30-second version, um, which is, um, as a result of the work that's been done so far, a whole load of these documents were produced, uh, and the subject uh, for tonight's is, uh, as you can see on the, on the right there, uh, to do with organic monomers. Um, and uh, Jamie and Greg are gonna, uh, and Doug are going to walk us through um, that document in a second. Um, the document is a Google Doc, and you will be able to comment directly in the document um, once the webinar is finished. Um, so we'll open those documents up. There are guidelines on the astrobiologyfuture.org website about how, how the commenting uh, should go. So uh, please go and have a look at that uh, after the webinar. Um, this is the second one, uh, of the, and there are quite a few in the diary. All the dates are available on the website, um, so uh, we can, you can go and have a look and, uh, and check up on those. Um, the format for this evening really is 10-15 um, minutes presentation uh, from the guys there, um, and then we'll open it up to any discussion or questions uh, that people have. So as you're listening and watching uh, this evening, if you've got any thoughts or comments or questions you want to uh, bring up towards the end, then either just make a note or you can always um, type stuff straight into the chat window here. Um, and uh, myself and Marco will do our best uh, to, to kind of uh, organize those a little bit so the presenters can respond to them afterwards. Um, and uh, you can always you can also use the raise hand feature, which is at the top of the screen on the left hand side there, uh, if there's anything you want to uh, say towards the end. Um, other than that, the only thing to mention, which I think Marco already uh, uh, suggested, we are recording all these sessions tonight. So when we open it up for, for conversation, that will also be part of the recording. Um, and uh, other than that, I think we should be good to go. So I don't know, um, uh, Greg, Jamie, uh, Doug, I don't know who was going to uh, kick off uh, this evening. I'm going to um, give a little introduction, and then we're going to split up talking about the sub-questions of the document, and then I'll do a little wrap-up, and then hopefully we'll get a lot of discussion from the participants. Brilliant. Um, okay, thanks, Jamie. So if anybody has any questions before we go, just uh, throw them up in the chat window. Uh, but assuming we're all, uh, we're all good to go, I'll uh, hand over to you, Jamie. Okay. So I just want to reiterate that you know, making this roadmap is supposed to be community-driven and community-supported, and this document that we're presenting today is the product of a small group of authors with comments from a slightly larger group, but we're really considering it still a draft. We're just talking about how it, it needs some more edits and comments to probably reorganize things and to make sure that we haven't missed any important um, topic points here. So we really hope that we'll get some good comments and um, conversation going from this. But the question that we're focusing on in this document is what are the sources of organic monomers relevant to the origin of life, so particularly the abiotic sources of the ingredients that we need for life, and um, a little bit more, uh, here's a little more explanation of where this topic came from. We were coming at it from thinking that the first step in the formation of organic life is the formation of simple organic compounds. You need to have the ingredients, the building blocks, before life can get started. And there's a lot of different sources for these monomers, for these simple organic compounds, both exogenous sources off of the Earth and endogenous sources on the early Earth. And we listed a variety of potential environments um, that are worthy of studying, like the interstellar medium, protoplanetary disks, comets, asteroids, parent bodies, planetary atmospheres, and planetary environments. And I will say that I think that the author group that worked on this was a little biased towards the exogenous sources. We didn't have... Um, a lot of examples given in this document right now of planetary environments that um, we want to study. We, we tend to say hydrothermal vents a lot. We probably need to include some other uh, planetary environments as well. Mm -hmm. But so the idea is we're looking at all of these different sources of organic monomers. And a little bit more um, justification for this, we really are interested in understanding the inventory of ingredients, the building blocks that were present when life originated and they can form in a variety of environments. And in these environments, they'll form in different distributions, different compound groups might form under different conditions. And we really want to understand this to help us not only understand the origin of life on the early Earth, but also to help constrain environments that we might look at elsewhere to understand where life could originate. 
And there's this comment at the bottom of this justification saying that we only know that life was able to originate on Earth under the conditions about three and a half to four billion years ago. We don't know whether life could originate under today's conditions. I think that that language was added not really to limit things, but to point out that there's a lot of study going on trying to understand how life could originate under those conditions um, three and a half to four billion years ago. But there's probably study that also needs to happen understanding the um, organic monomers that could be produced under other conditions as well. So we broke down this big question into 12 sub-questions, and we're just going to step through them and briefly introduce them, and then at the end hopefully try and show you how this all ties in with the rest of the roadmap and see what conversation we might get from all of the participants. I think Doug is going to start with sub-question one. Okay, so sub-question one concerns um, the quality and quantity of organics, and do they differ in planetary systems um, formed in different environments, particularly comparing, say, giant molecular clouds with low-mass isolated systems? And that there are a couple of different um, possible influences here. One is simply the fact that the, the location in the galaxy and also, of course, the, the age, of the, the time of formation affects the total availability of metallicity because of the, um, the enrichment of the interstellar medium over time and also over space as a gradient with respect to position in the galaxy. But also, even if we just consider the, you know, the solar neighborhood of the galaxy, which is fairly homogeneous in terms of the chemical elements, there's a huge difference between a massive star formation region and a low mass star formation region. The, the examples that astronomers typically give are the Orion molecular cloud for a massive region and the, the Taurus molecular cloud for a low mass region. And that kind of arises out of the fact that um, low mass stars like the Sun and like red dwarfs are much, much more common than very high mass stars. So if you, if you um, only say you have 100 stars, the chances of finding one really massive one in that group is pretty small. Whereas if you have 1,000 stars, it's, the chances of finding a really massive star is, is fairly large. And the, it's the massive stars that can really influence the environment in which the stars form um, by producing a very strong ultraviolet radiation field um, once they you know, emerge from the protostellar envelope. And also, even by going supernova within the time scale of, a, of the time that it takes for a much smaller star to be born. Um, so we'd really um, you know, like to know what are the differences between those star formation regions. And of course, also, where, where, what sort of region did the sun form in? Well, there are statistical arguments to say that the sun formed in a, a massive star formation region. And there's also some isotopic evidence that suggests that. We don't know for sure, um, and in any case, we need to study both kinds because we're interested in the potential for you know, organic materials making life in either of those environments. And the photochemistry could be very important in a massive star formation region where you've got a lot of ultraviolet radiation from these massive stars. OK, so I can advance to sub-question two. Um, so what are the relative importances of molecules produced in the molecular cloud compared with um, those that are being modified on the protoplanetary disk? This is kind of a, a question of, I guess, nature versus nurture. You know, are the initial conditions um, that at the start of the collapse of a, a region to become an isolated young stellar object, are they, are they sort of the, the be all and end all, or, or is there a lot of evolution along the way? Um, so we know in our own solar system, for example, that some of the material we find in meteorites is pre-solar. We can show that from isotopic studies. But most of those materials, are, are this, first of all, they're not very abundant. And secondly, um, they're mostly refractory materials. We'd really like to know more about the organics, the organic refractory material, the icy material. Is that some of that pre-solar as well or not? And it's always been assumed that comets are a likely place to find some pre-solar material. But the amount of mixing that appears to have gone on in the solar nebula has thrown that into, I won't say a state of confusion, but certainly a state of you know, questioning original assumptions. Um, OK, uh, let's move on to number three then. So if we put all this together, I think as Jamie mentioned, um, 
my expertise, and I think those of many of the other authors here are more biased towards um, the first of the things in this list, but we need to consider them all, you know, and each one kind of feeds into the, to the next. So you have interstellar chemistry feeding into a protoplanetary disk, feeding into material that forms on, on a planet and being modified in planetary atmospheres and um, water-rich environments as well. And each of these requires different mechanisms, but they all may influence the outcome. You know, the outcome is what, one of the raw materials for life. And we need to understand each of these in turn. And we also need to understand their relative importance. Um, if you change one, does it have a drastic effect on, on the others and so on. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say about uh, number three. So I'll turn it back to Jamie now. Thanks, Greg. Is, uh, is taking over. Yeah, this is Greg Springsteen uh, from uh, Furman University. I'm going to cover the uh, next three sub-questions, so four through six. And I think what, what ties these sub-questions together um, is the idea that we really, um, it, in many of these questions, want to be looking at the, at the thermodynamics, uh, so looking at both the degradation as well as, as the formation of many of these organics and what kind of concentrations that we might expect in a variety of environments. So uh, I'm not going to read through all the slides, but um, I, I'll talk briefly through them. So number four, what is the survivability of organic monomers in their formation environment? So we're, we're certainly agnostic on what this environment in which the organic molecules were formed or these, uh, these uh, pre-polymer uh, monomers were formed. But within a variety of environments that, that we all as a field can think of, um, you know, what are the relative rates of formation, uh, what uh, kinds of degradation pathways do we need to be thinking about as well? Uh, Sub-question five is a little bit more specific on a, on, on a degradation pathway. Uh, if these uh, organic monomers were formed off Earth, uh, we need to think about the mechanisms of delivery to Earth and also the mechanisms of, of, of degradation, both atmospheric to Earth and also delivery to other bodies as well. And so this is what is the survivability of organic monomers in their formation environments. And I, and I think uh, in this stream of consciousness where we uh, originally this document was created, we we're using survivability really as um, this catch-all term for thermodynamics. We've got to be thinking about both parts of the equation. And then uh, sub-question six is a bit more specific. Um, yeah, I've gone the wrong way. No, I haven't. Just on my screen. So question six, what are the endogenous organic production processes active on the early Earth? I think many of us are particularly interested in uh, what are the possibilities of organic formation on the early Earth, whether we're talking about the hydrothermal vents uh, or, or the variety of, of other environments we can think of on the early Earth. So this is going to require special, I think, consideration. Um, and so this sub-question, um, although maybe a sub-sub-question of four, um, will have a, a special emphasis talking about the uh, variety of kinetic and thermodynamic parameters on the formation in earlier. Okay, so I'll pick it up for number seven. Um, so looking specifically at the... Uh, and uh, external sources of organics, we need to consider, for example, do, do the organics and the, and the water come together, or, or are they sort of separate questions? And if, if we think in terms of comets being a key source of material, then obviously the, the ices and the organics are closely mixed in those and would come in together. That's true to a lesser extent of asteroids as well, of course, because we're coming increasingly to realize that, that asteroid-type bodies can contain volatiles as well, water and hydration and so on. Um, so evaluation of those two different classes of objects and their relative fluxes and of course the survivability as well because the dynamics of the asteroid population compared with the comet population is very different and the, um, the impact speed, for example, is very different which may uh, affect the survivability. So we'd like to know that the flux rates uh, and the dynamical factors that may affect survivability. Um, okay, turning to number eight, what is the relative importance of exogenous and endogenous sources of organic compounds? Again, that comes down to um, a number of factors, which include some that have already been mentioned, such as survivability. Um, 
if you have a, a flux of organic material, you don't necessarily know whether it's going to survive the, the journey to the surface of the Earth. Um, and of course, these are very different, difficult questions to answer. We, um, we don't really know what the impact flux was at those early times. We know about the late heavy bombardment. We don't know what the flux rate was like before that. There are ways to, to try and answer that question. Um, so perhaps one of the, the key things that we, we bring out there is, are there, are there any particular materials or classes of material that, that are unique to a particular mechanism? Um, and, and an example that springs to mind that may turn out to be important or not is the fact that we have these meteorites with amino acids in them that contain a chiral asymmetry. Um, was that the key thing that caused homochirality on the Earth? Uh, that's one avenue of exploration that might, you know, and I'm sure there are many other examples that might show, well, this is a unique source of the materials that, that can't, perhaps can't get here in any other way. Okay, I'll turn it back to you, James. All right, so sub-question nine had to do with how different energy sources result in different organic production. So again, we're looking at a whole variety of environments and different chemical reactions. You might have the same precursor material in different regions that have um, different energy sources and different thermodynamic and kinetic drivers. And again, they might be producing unique or distinct distributions of compounds. And um, we're trying to understand that, again, so we can um, tie it all into what the overall inventory was and what Doug was just saying about understanding if any particular source produced unique distributions, unique compounds that were essential. Focuses on the energy. Sub-question 10 gets at also what Doug was just saying about homochirality. Were enantiomeric excesses at the monomer level important in establishing homochirality in life? So we know life today, that homochirality is essential to life today, but we don't know at what stage in the origin of life that originated. So we have these clues from some carbonaceous meteorites that have enantiomeric excesses of some compounds, so, but we don't understand how those were produced at the monomer level, how that excess was produced. And then we don't know whether that excess at the monomer level exerted any influence on the emergence of biological homochirality, or maybe not. Maybe homochirality emerged later on in the origination of life by trying to understand um, whether the monomer uh, excesses had any role in homochirality is an interesting question. So question 11 is a little bit similar. It's trying to understand the connection between the organic monomers produced and those used in terrestrial biology. Because chemistry, abiotic chemistry, produces a wide range of compounds, only some of which are used by life. And trying to understand why life selected those particular subgroup of compounds, is there, what, what's the driving force behind that? Um, does it have to do with uh, ease of production or other drivers? Um, will help uh, understand the relative importance of all of these compounds for the origin of life. And the last sub-question we had was, what changes take place to these organics over time in the terrestrial environment? And this ties back a bit to the earlier questions that Greg had about survivability. But basically, you know, once you have all of these different sources of organics on the, on the surface of the early Earth on another planetary surface, what further chemistry happens, further synthesis or reaction, um, functionalization, and how do these interplay together to um, lead to a more, uh, a more a richer organic inventory and eventually to the origin of life? So those are the 12 sub-questions that we came up with when we, were doing, when we were creating this document originally. It's quite possible that we're missing some or that some are redundant or unnecessary or unclear, and so we'd really like to make sure that the community participates in um, letting us know that so that in the next round of edits we can get a more coherent document. And the last thing I want to show before we um, open this up for discussion is just the overall roadmap network as it is right now. I'll zoom in in a second because I know this is hard to read. And I saw in that poll that many of you tuned into the webinar last week where Michael New presented this. This is sort of how all the different roadmap documents are connected right now. Um, and if we, on the left, you can see there's sort of a group of documents that are prebiotic to biotic chemistry. And if we zoom in there, it's still a little hard to see. We're, we're looking at document three right now. What are the sources of organic monomers relevant to the origin of life? 
And it ties in a little bit to document two, which I think is going to have a webinar next week about primitive icy bodies and chemistry there. But what we were really envisioning when we came up with this document was that the organic monomers that we're discussing here then feed into more steps of polymerization, functionalization, and eventually that green box at the bottom is uh, what did the earliest life look like? So that's how we see th how this question ties into some of the bigger astrobiology questions. And then that arrow that's going off screen um, connects to another box, another document about biosignatures, because obviously understanding the abiotic chemical distributions that can be formed is important so that we're able to recognize biosignatures and distinguish them from, uh, chemical, uh, from abiotic chemicals. So that's where this document fits into the bigger network. And I think you've now had an overview of everything that's in that Google document. And hopefully there are some questions or comments from the participants now. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so basically we want to just encourage you now um, to uh, having heard the structure and, and what's in the, uh, the document there, and hopefully you've had the chance to have a look at the document itself, to see if anybody has any uh, immediate comments or questions or things they'd like to raise uh, with the group and get uh, some feedback from Greg and Jamie and Doug uh, while we're all online. Um, so um, uh, John, I think uh, you wanted to, uh, to contribute something. Uh, I saw you put your hand up there. Well, I hope it's a contribution. Um, I do have kind of a shortage of time today, but as I listened to the sub-questions come through, it seemed to me that the basic motif that was being addressed was one where the entire Earth is a warm little pond of sorts, and we're going to fill it up full of organic monomers and then see if something cool happens. And what I didn't hear... Uh, was the specific addressing of an interaction between a dynamic environment on the Earth and the development of organic monomers in the context of a potentially um, self-replicating process. Uh, and so rather than thinking of organic monomers that are something that are floating around and are lucky enough to run into uh, either, you know, the right clays or some kind of mineral surfaces or uh, maybe a low temperature hydrothermal vent environment a la Jack Corliss. Um, I, I'm thinking of, you know, how much feedback does the Earth system have on the development of these monitors in the context of the origin of life itself? as opposed to the concept of an organic soup of one kind or another. Uh, so that was just my take-home message is that there might be more interaction and some kind of a, a feedback process that doesn't seem to be addressed in the questions the way I read them now. Thank you. Thanks, that'll John. Be, that'll be a good thing to add in on the next round of edits. That last sub-question 12 about what happens to these monomers once they're in the environment, I think, could be expanded and reworked to address what you just, um, what you just brought up, the interaction between the environment and the chemistry. Well, it may be that the environment doesn't produce the right organic monomers um, off the bat, and that you, in fact, have to have this interaction to get the monomers of interest produced in the first place. Right. Um, that's kind of the way I'm looking at it. Part of our discussion uh, of not um, uh, uh, talking about what specific sort of micro environments might be of interest was not to was an attempt not to limit what the proposals of those micro environments might be, uh, and it wasn't a sense of well let's just treat the um, Earth environment as a global one, um, but but yeah just rather idea let's not limit the ideas out there. Well, thanks. thanks. Um, good luck with it. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, so uh, just to make sure if anybody else has uh, any uh, comments they want to make or questions they want to ask or anything uh, to be clarified, um, uh, I think that the, the line is, uh, is open. Um, if there are more than one person, if you at the top of the screen there, there's a raise hand button and we can uh, work through people if there are any uh, comments. Uh, so, yeah, Pauline, do you want to uh, go ahead next? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. 
I think another question that is uh, really going to be very difficult to answer is the very vast heterogeneity uh, on just our planet in terms of uh, varying temperatures and varying concentrations of water and cycling of temperature and uh, cycling of conditions so that in any one place uh, the answer may be very different from what the answer might be in some other place, uh, maybe only even uh, uh, meters away. Um, and now, uh, given, again, the vast amount of time that we might be talking about and those kinds of changes, uh, some of these may be very difficult questions to ask because all we have to do is find something that happened once. Uh, it, it may have happened many, many times, but it had to only be successful once. Uh, and that's, I think, going to um, add another layer uh, to the difficulty in answering some of these questions. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. Jamie, Greg, Doug, I don't know whether you did you want to respond on that, or um, we, is that to add into the comments in the documents again? Yeah, I mean, uh, information overload is a serious problem, and I, you know, I, I really get the comment, right? We, we we can get as many results as we have time for experiment, and our analytical techniques are, are uh, good enough to pick up. So, definitely an issue. Brilliant. Thanks, Greg. Okay. Any other uh, any other questions? Any other uh, comments? That anybody wants to uh, to chip in? As I said before, the document um, will be opened up for commenting um, as soon as the, this webinar finishes. So uh, you'll have a chance to go and review and um, and put your comments uh, if you prefer to to kind of think and type and and check them into the document. There, there'll be plenty of opportunity to do that. Um, but if there are any other, any other comments, questions now you want to uh, open up, then please go ahead. I suspect if, if there's nobody else uh, wants to ask anything in this, uh, in this particular open forum, I suspect we're probably at the end. I don't know, um, uh, Greg, Jamie, Doug, whether you had any uh, concluding remarks or comments you want to make, or are, you, are, we all, uh, are we all good to go? I think we're good. I just um, hope that people will make comments on the Google Doc uh, so that we can incorporate everyone's viewpoints into the final document. Exactly. I mean, just to reiterate what Jamie said at the beginning, there we're really hoping for a, a big community effort to to make these documents as good as they possibly can be. Uh, we have quite a bit of time, I think, between now and next April before uh, the process kind of rolls forward. So, um, so please do get stuck in and read through and uh, and comment. And I know the authors will will value that and they'll they'll respond to the comments as well. So, uh, we can get a bit of a discussion going. Sorry, Greg. I think uh, no, I was just going to reiterate what uh, Jamie had said before, that uh, it, it was a stream of consciousness from a limited group of people with certainly not um, expertise everywhere. So we really need people from a variety of expertises uh, looking at the document and commenting on it. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, this is Ronald Breslow at uh, Columbia. I just joined this. I'm sorry. I got caught up in something else, and I suddenly realized I was late. But I'm uh, no problem. now part of it. Yeah. Oh, this no is problem. Bill Irvin. Mass, uh, in connection with sub-question one, Doug was talking about uh, perhaps it would be useful to comment on uh, or raise the question of uh, what happens at high redshift uh, when in galaxies where the uh, uh, chemical abundances or the elemental abundances may be different in our local environment. If we want to think about the universe as a whole and possible early uh, uh, possible life in, in uh, quite different environments. Well, that, yeah, that's a good point. Um, I think if we could understand our own local environment better, it would give us more of a perspective to understand another one. But, of course, as you know, abundance variations occur within our own galaxy before you even think about other galaxies. Right. Mm -hmm. right thanks, Bill. Any other comments? Any other uh, questions people want to open up right now? If not, um, hopefully we'll see you online, either on the website in discussion forum or in the document in the comments section. Um, we look forward to hearing from you all. Um, thanks again it. for submitting Go, comments. Hey, everybody. Sorry, that's um, this is Sorry, this is Lindsay Hayes. Um, I just wanted to make a comment just so we could be clear about the scheduling. I'm not sure if something got lost. Um, we're looking to finish the webinars at the end of this 
calendar year or maybe a little bit into next year, and we're looking to produce the final document by, by April. So we definitely have a, you know, a good amount of time to be working on these, but not quite all the way until April. Okay, sorry. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, that's great. Sorry, Doug, were you, was there, were you making a comment before that? I'm going to make, make a comment along the same lines. I think it's good to get things done quickly, right? I think, I think if ever, people on this webinar have comments, I would recommend they go and write them now rather than you know, wait sometime down the line when they probably forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Greg. Um, I hope that was useful and interesting to everyone listening in, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you online. So uh, go there now and, uh, and start commenting. <laughs> I'll make sure that document gets opened up straight away, so hopefully in the next couple of minutes you should be able to, uh, to get in there. Okay, thanks all. Great, thanks.